we all need joy. <laughs> because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if we don't have strength, we can't make it in life. So if we don't have joy, we don't have strength. If we don't have strength, we're going to be defeated and live defeated lives. God wants us to live a life full of joy. We're going to take a look at, at, at Philippians chapter 3 on how do we have a life that is full of joy. And it's taking a different path than most sermons on joy that I've preached before. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, look at this. It says, whatever happens, let's just stop there a second. See, we think, well, circumstances got to be good for me to have joy. No, the apostle Paul right there says, whatever happens, whatever, our joy is not determined by our circumstances. He says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. No matter what you're going through, no matter if you messed up, no matter if, if things are good or if things are bad, it says no matter what happens, rejoice in the Lord. And he goes and says this, I never get tired of telling you these things. What's the Apostle Paul saying there? i got to repeat myself to you over and over again. This is a message you need to hear over and over again, is never quit rejoicing in the Lord. He goes, I never get tired of telling you this. Why? And I do it to safeguard your faith. If we don't have joy in our life, our faith will be weak. And the Apostle Paul says, I'm going to keep telling you this and telling you this and telling you this and telling you this so joy can be the center point of your life, that you'll walk around with joy no matter what is going on in your life. Now, if you study the book of Philippians, it is an amazing book on joy. I mean, every single chapter, one, two, three, all the chapters, you could find a message, you could preach a message on joy. And as you look at it and you break it down, in every one of those chapters, there also, he shows us things that are, I, I call them joy killers or joy stealers. There are things that come to try to steal our joy. Because if the joy of the Lord is our strength and the devil knows that, what's he going to do? He recognizes if he can steal our joy, if he can kill our joy, he can get victory over us and we won't walk in victory. So we're going to look at a few of the joy killers in our life. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. It says, for as I have often told you before and now say again. What is he doing? He's saying, I got to tell you over and over again. Who ever feels like that? Lord, I need to hear it. Lord, I need it. It's not like I've heard this message before. The apostle Paul said, you need to hear it again. <laughs> over and over again, so our joy will be strong. It says, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. If you look in these scriptures, there are three joy killers or joy stealers uh, that we see in those two verses. You're taking notes, you can write this down. The first joy stealer is to be unaware of the benefits of the cross. If you look at that verse, and we don't realize what Jesus did for us. If we are not aware of what Jesus did when he died on the cross, if we're unaware of the benefits of the cross, then we won't have joy. You see people who get religious and they do this all the time. What do they do? They work and 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 work so they can try to be right with God. And then, and then it never gives them joy because they're trying to do it in their own. Why? Because they're not recognizing the work of the cross. You see, I can't work to be right. Now, I can do things to discipline my mind and do the right things, but I can't make myself right with God. I cannot work hard enough to be right. The Bible says we're the righteousness of God in Christ. I can't work hard enough to be right with him. That's why Jesus came and died for me, so I could live right with him. And if we don't recognize that he paid the price for us, we can't have joy because we're trying to work and we're trying to work and we're trying to work and we're trying to work, and then when we fail, we fall down miserably. Who's ever felt like that? But if we're aware of the benefits of the cross, it will give us joy. Here's another one, another thing that, that will try to, to kill our joy. It's to be addicted to pleasure. Addiction to pleasure will destroy our joy. Look at this. Their, in, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is their shame. Look about that. How many of us live our life, we live our life, addicted to pleasure i just next thing that makes me happy next thing that makes me happy next thing you know what if i get this new car then i'll be happy if i get this new house then i'll be happy if i get a different relationship then i'll be happy when the fact is we live our life so many times chasing pleasure pleasure will never fulfill you as a matter of fact if you chase pleasure it's going to leave you more and more empty 
give you an example of this. I remember as a young man, I, I had always grown up with a car that wasn't very nice. And I just thought, well, if I work hard enough, I get a nice car, life will be so much better. I worked hard. I got a nicer car. After a few weeks of having that car, I felt even more empty. Can I tell you why? Because the thing I thought would give me joy, I recognized this is not my path to joy. So I'm in here, and you're in a relationship. You're married, and you look at your spouse, and you're like, oh, I need somebody else so I can be happy. No, that's not the problem. The problem usually is not them. The problem is something internally inside of you. If I'm looking, if I'm looking for my wife, as wonderful as she is, to be the one who gives me joy, I am a host. Because there will be times where she gives me happiness and joy, but there will be times where I just don't feel it. And the fact is, she was never designed. I was not designed to be her joy giver. Jesus, God is the one who gives us joy. Then everything else, listen, everything else, everything else that we can do for each other as a couple is icing on the cake. But what do we do? We realize we're not going to live. We are not going to live our life addicted to pleasure. Chasing pleasure never ends also. You'll go from this one to this one. I'm chasing, I'm chasing, I'm chasing. And once you catch this one, you've got to find another one. Here's another thing that is a joy killer. It's to be earthly minded. Earthly, all I think about is stuff. All I think about is the stuff of this world. And I want to say this. Being earthly minded isn't just about bad things on this earth. You can, you can be earthly minded about things that are not bad at all. But they can lead you to having your joy stolen away. How do we change that? Look in Romans chapter 12. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how the world decides for us what joy is? The world decides for us what, what is success. The joy decides for us what is a good marriage. The world decides for us what should our life look like when the fact is the world is messed up. And I'm amazed at how the church and how we so many times try to look like and be like that, when the fact is we chase Jesus. Don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. If we want to change things, we've got to change the way we think. Start pumping the word of God in our brain, renewing of your mind, then you'll, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and his perfect will. Romans chapter 8, verse 6, it says, The mind of a sinful man leads to death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. How many want that in your life? A mind controlled by the Spirit, a mind where we think God's thoughts, where we think His ways, where, where our measure of success is not, is not having the best house or the, the best job or, or what everyone else looks at. Some of the most miserable people are people who look like they have everything, but on the inside they have nothing. We're not called to live like that as followers of Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, we're supposed to live differently. So what do we have to have when we want to have a key to joy? Here's a key to joy that you may not hear very often, and, and I want us to get it inside of our heart. Look in, in Philippians 3.20. Here's a key to joy. But our citizenship is in heaven as we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we want to live a life full of joy, I would encourage us to live a life thinking about the eternal. See, we live our lives so many times basing our joy based upon the temporary, or people call it the temporal. The, the temporary determines my joy. As a follower of Jesus, the Bible says my citizenship is not here on this planet. I'll be honest with you. I love that I live in the United States of America. I, I, I love this country. I am uh, a United States, I mean, I love the USA. But here's the fact. We don't live the American dream. We are called to live the God dream. And I love taking young people and people in general on mission trips to other countries to where you will go and you will see how blessed we are here in this country. I, I mean, I love it. I, I remember going on a mission trip to Mexico, and we were on this trip, and we were staying with this pastor in his house, which was, which was made of mud and had a, a thatched roof and had a dirt floor. And, and for dinner that night, he cooked one of the pigs, his pet pigs that lived in his house. They would raise these pigs up, and he had these pigs, and he killed it for us. And I remember looking at this group of teenagers, and I said to every one of them, you will eat this pig. And if you don't like it, you will shove the pig in your mouth and you will eat this pig with a smile. And if you are allergic to pork, we will pray for you. 
Because this guy is giving his best to us, and we're going to honor that. And I remember we walk away, and these young people, you know, the ones who came before and said, well, I just, I just can't be happy because I don't have the nicest phone. You don't need the nicest phone to have joy. You don't need all the stuff to have joy. But in this country, we don't realize how blessed we are. And, and then we get our focus on what does someone else have and our focus is so temporary that it leads us on this roller coaster where we really don't have joy at all. In order to be eternally mindful, we have to have this mindset. Our joy focus has to be not just on today, but our joy focus needs to be on eternity. So we don't live for right now. If you're living for right now, you're going to live for emptiness. There's something bigger than living for right now. If you're taking notes, we're going to talk about three ways to be eternally mindful. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. If we want to be eternally mindful, and we find this in the book of Philippians, we need to see God's redemption for my yesterday. Write this beside that. See God's redemption for my yesterday. Write this beside that. Don't let your past define you. Let your past refine you. See, so many people, we let our past define who we are, and God doesn't want our past to define us, but God wants our past to refine us, to make us into who he's called us to be. See, God will take your past, which many people would say would, might be, might, you don't understand my past, Pastor Tom. Here's why I understand. The guy who's going to say these words to us was a murderer of Christians who had the worst past imaginable, and, and look what he found. Look there in, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. It says, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Think about that. I consider everything, the things we strive for, the things we want, the things we're like, gotta have, gotta, 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 gotta. Everything doesn't matter compared to knowing him. And this is coming from a guy who had a tainted past and was known as a Christ and a Christ follower killer. He killed followers or imprisoned followers of Christ, but he did not let his past stop him. As a matter of fact, I said this, don't let your past define you, but let your past refine you. Take what was used and meant for evil in your past, and God's going to use that for you to be able to reach into other people's lives and other people's worlds. You're going to be able to speak life to people who have gone through the same thing that you went through or in the middle of it, and you speak life to them because God will take your past and make it into something beautiful to help other people out of that place. Let's go ahead and keep going. It says, for, for whose sake I have lost everything. What I consider them rubbish. Look at this. That I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own. I can't work about it. That comes from the law. I can't work to make myself right. But look at this. But which is found through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes by God and is by faith. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. That's not something you see on tattoos very often, is it? I want to know the, the, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I want to suffer. Woo! Yeah! Yeah! That's the Bible. That does not match up with our American dream. That is the Bible. God, I, 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 God, I don't want the temporary to determine what gives me joy. Well, temporarily, I'm suffering. Temporarily, I'm going through a hard time temporarily maybe i made a decision for christ and i lost my friends temporarily you know what when i gave my life to christ i have more integrity and it causes me to suffer here's what i would say temporary suffering leads to eternal rejoicing because sometimes when we suffer things on this planet for christ there's going to be a reward in heaven from christ everybody grab hold of that truth that when we realize and recognize, hey, we're going through some stuff right now, but God's going to help us through this stuff, and he's got a greater plan for us. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and to somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. If we want to have joy in our life, we need to be eternally mindful and realize that God's redemption, that he has redemption for my yesterday. There's nothing you've been through or done 
that God doesn't have an eternal plan for that's bigger than you are. Here's the next thought if you're taking notes. See God's purpose for my today. I'm going to see his redemption for my yesterday, but I need to see his purpose for my today. Look at this. Not that I have already obtained all of this or, or have been made perfect, Look at, but I press on to take hold for that, which is, for that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I love the verbiage in this. It, it shows that we have to put something into it to get something out of it. And the fact is, is that God, if we want to have joy in our life, we have to recognize that God is redeeming our past, but God has a purpose for our present. Everybody look up here real quick. Everyone in this room, God has a purpose for your present. God has a purpose for your life right now that is bigger and greater than you could ever imagine or dream. God has a purpose for your present. You're like, I don't see it. I don't feel it. Here's what you have to do sometimes. When you don't see it in you, you don't feel it. I'm starting a new series next week on faith. You don't want to miss it. I am so pumped about this series called Faith Is. And what you have to do if you want to get to that place, you're sitting there, I don't know, God. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You know what you do? You get up off your rear end and do something. It takes faith to do that. I have some steps for you. It's not in your notes. Write these down. How do we get to that place where we recognize and and find God's purpose for my life? First thing you need to do, recognize discontent recognize discontent. What does that mean? When you're at this place where you're like, I just don't feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I just, I just feel like life should be more and bigger than this. And you recognize discontent. And here's what I want to say. Once you recognize discontent, take discontent to the right place. Because I know people who recognize discontent, and what they do is, well, I'm discontent. I'm just not happy. Well, I'm not happy because I'm married to her. I'm not happy because I'm married to him. That's not your reason for discontent. Everybody grab this. Your reason for discontent is because you are not fulfilling the purpose and the plan of God for your life. And until we get to that place where we recognize I have a purpose, until we get to that place where we, we acknowledge I have a purpose, until we recognize this discontent in me is placed here by God because I am not where I'm supposed to be. Now everybody look at me. You could be in a good place. God doesn't want you in a good place. God wants you in the great place. I remember a couple of times in our life, we were doing some really good stuff. We were youth pastors. We had over a 1,000 kids in our youth group, and God started dealing with this. You know, go start a church. Go start a church. Don't want to. And every night, God would mess with me. Every time I'd get quiet, God would mess with me. And you know what? Inside, I became discontent, and I recognized, you know what? God has another step for me to take. God has. I remember looking at my wife one time, and I, and I, I said, honey, we got to take this step because here's the deal. Here's the deal. I can live with trying and failing, but I cannot live without trying. Get to this place where you're discontent. You're like, I got to get this. and No, it's, it's eternal. Recognize discontent in your life. Here's the next thing. Once you recognize discontent, make a decision to do something about it. Make a decision. I'm not doing, I'm not fulfilling my purpose, so I'm going to do something about that. Everybody look up here and say, we think our purpose, our purpose. Well, uh, uh, my purpose is to be a preacher. My purpose is to be in full-time ministry. My purpose is that, can I tell you this? Full-time ministry is a calling that everyone has in our lives. Everybody look at me. Full-time ministry is not just being a preacher. It's, it's, it's representing Jesus everywhere we go. Some of the greatest full-time ministers I've met have never preached a sermon in their life because full-time ministry just means, Jesus, this is yours everywhere I go and in everything I do, and I don't have to make a dollar for it for this to be yours. Everybody get that? Full-time ministry, I tell you what, we could take a trip down right now, we could walk down a hallway, and we could find people who are fulfilling their purpose as they're loving on these little babies, and they're pouring into three- and four- and five-year-olds on the other side of this wall as they're pouring into to elementary school students. We could go upstairs with our junior high, and you could find people. See, our purpose isn't about being on stage. Our purpose is about doing what he says. We could go on Monday night, and I could show you people that are passing out food and loving on people and giving away clothes. Because that's their purpose. See, recognize discontent. Make a decision to get out of it. And here's the second thing. Sell out for that purpose. 
sell out for that purpose. Say, I'm selling out. Well, look at this again. It says, I press on. It says again, I press on. I'm straining toward. It's not giving minimal effort. It's not giving minimal effort. It's not giving minimal effort. It's giving great effort. You're like, I can't do this. I am not equipped to do this. Can I just share this with you? You don't have to have all the ability in order for God to use you. You just have to get out of your comfortable place and then watch God drop his ability inside of you. I coach a little league baseball team. I coach a 12 and under baseball team, and, and uh, one of my son plays on it. We are undefeated. Woo! Uh, we played the three worst teams in our league and beat them all, but we are undefeated, and, and I coach this team, and, and uh, we have this one young man on my team, and he is, he is not a very good baseball player. Great young man, not a very good baseball player. Something happened to him two years ago when he was 10 years old. He got hit in the face with a baseball. When he was playing, he got drilled in the face with a baseball when he was batting. Now, every time he gets up to bat, every time he gets up to bat, here's what he would do. He would get up to bat, the pitch would come, and he would back up. The pitch would come, and he's scared of the pitch. And I, I went up to him, and after he backed out the first time, I went up to him, I knelt down, and I was like, we don't do that here. I said, do you want to hit the ball? And he said, yes, sir, I want to hit the ball. I said, son, you're never going to hit the ball if you're going backwards. I said, you stay in there, and you just swing the bat. I said, you just get in there and you swing the bat. I said, I know you're afraid. I said, but do you want to hit the ball? He goes, yes, sir, I want to hit the ball. And I said, well, you do this. I said, next time you swing, you just take a step a little bit out. That's not a good way. You don't want him to do this. I said, you take a step and you swing. Here comes the next pitch. It was a horrible pitch, but he stepped and he swung and he missed it. And I ran up to him and I said, that was awesome, dude. I said, way to go, man. You did so much better than the pitch before. I said, here's what you're going to do this time. You're going to keep both feet in there. And you're going to swing the bat. He goes, okay, coach, I'll do it. Well, here comes the next pitch. The pitch is coming. As the pitch is coming, he closes both of his eyes. <laughs> closes his eyes and swings the bat. And he's done, and he looks, and he didn't hit it. He struck out, and he, he got out. And I went over to the dugout afterwards, and I pulled him to the side. Like, dude, that was awesome, man. Did you know that? You didn't back out even an inch. Let's do me a favor. Next time you get up the next pitch, let's have one eye open. <laughs> Let's just open up one eye, son. Just one eye. Can you do that? Yes, coach, I can do that. He got up to bat next time. He opened up one eye. He, he should have opened up the eye closer to the, closest to the pitcher. He opened up the wrong one. He swung. He missed it. But he stayed in there. I'm like, whoa, way to go. I went up. Now let's do both eyes. Both eyes open. You can do this. Do you know what that little boy did last game we played? He hit the ball every time he got up. Hit the ball every time he got up. He got thrown out. He didn't get it past the pitcher, but he hit the ball every time he got up. And I go, uh, uh, he went from this to this <laughs> to hitting the ball. By the end of the year, he's going to be hitting the ball in the outfield. Amen. Here's what I want to say. I just don't have the ability, Lord. I just can't do it. Get up off your rear end and just swing. And you'd be amazed what God can do with the swing. I believe this. Everybody looking at me. I believe there's a move of God coming upon our country. I believe there's a revival that's going to hit our country in, in a big and amazing way. And I believe this. Matter of fact, come on up here, Kim. My wife had a prophetic word the Lord gave her the other day, and she sent it to me. And, and uh, she sent it to me, and she read it to me. I started crying because I said, that is the Lord. And, and I, I believe this. I'm going to let her read it, but there's a move of God coming in our country. And you know what God needs? God doesn't need the big names on the platform. God needs every one of us to fulfill our purpose to have that move of God. Go ahead and read that, what God gave you. This is on April 19th, so it was about a week ago. With the appointment of this new Supreme Court judge, the tides have turned spiritually for America. My mercy has been unleashed anew. Righteousness in the court will mirror righteousness in the church. Both institutions are awakening to my righteousness, to the necessity of change, to the abhorrence of sin and evil. Awaken to what I want to do in this land. You've been asleep too long. Arise, awaken out of your slumber and laziness. As you roll out of your slumber, out of your bed, you must roll onto your faces and cry out to me for mercy. It is available to you, but you must ask for it with your mouths, your hearts, your actions. When your action of obedience lines up with my will, you will see a sudden turning of hearts to the fathers. It must begin with a repentant and contrite heart followed by clear actions. Revival is on the doorstep and like nothing this world has ever seen, yes. but it begins with prayer, repentance, and obedient actions. I lost my place. 
There is no room for pride, ego, and personalities. I'm going to use the most unlikely people. Hmm. It won't be the big-name preachers with big churches. I will work through those no one would suspect so that the enemy, it takes the enemy by surprise. I'm working even now preparing this army and its leaders. They are almost ready, but not yet, in my time and in my way. And then this is just a, a kind of an impression I had, and I wrote it in first person. I feel like it's going to be this obscure force of young people who will all of a sudden get mobilized somehow, some way. It will happen all over the nation in different spots. I don't even know it, if people will know their names, but it won't matter, and it won't matter to them. These must be among the most humble of people who, are, who truly know and recognize they are nothing without God, and they consider others as better than themselves. Lord, I thank you, God, that you want to move in our country. God, and I ask that you would use us. God, I ask that you would give us our purpose, that everyone in this room would come alive with the purpose that you've plant, planted inside of our hearts and our lives. God, I ask that we would humble ourselves and that we would seek your face. I ask that, I ask that we would have an eternal mindset to not want what we want, Father, but to want what you want. God, I ask that you would help us not to want to play church, but you would put a hunger in us to be the church and to take your love to a world that's hurting. God, move in this place. Move in our lives. God, I pray for the purposes that have been dead and buried in this room to come alive today. I pray for those in this room who saw themselves as being able to do nothing for you that you would give them dreams. I pray for those that are too busy to do, that they would set aside their busyness and look toward the goal of eternity. Father, let us be your church. Amen. Amen. God's purpose is for each one of us. And we don't measure it by anyone else's purpose. We measure it by what he has called us to do. Grab hold of that. And in the view of eternity, let's go with that. Let's look at the last one. We see God's redemption for my yesterday. We see God's purpose for my today. We need to do this. We need to see God's plan for my tomorrow. We have joy when we see that he, he's going to redeem what was in my past, he's going to give me purpose for what is right now, and then he's got a plan for what is ahead of me. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, it says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they might be like his glorious body. Do you know, we live our life, we live our life on this planet for a short frame of time. Say, say we live to be 100 years, that is long, but in true reality, that is short. And it's amazing how we live such a short frame of time, but we live that short frame of time so focused on that short frame of time when honestly, we should live that short frame of time invested for eternity. And if we get that mindset, here's what I would say. The Apostle Paul thrown in jail, the Apostle Paul who was beaten regularly, the Apostle Paul who was abused greater than we could ever imagine or dream, the Apostle Paul constantly said, rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because in the midst of struggles, joy is there if our mindset changes from what I have right now to what I am going to become and where I will be and the rewards that I will have once I get there. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm not the kind of person, never have been, that says, man, I can't wait till Jesus comes back. I honestly, can I, just, I don't want him to come back right now. Can I tell you why? There are a bunch of people that aren't ready. <laughs> I look up and I think, Lord, please don't come back because there's a bunch of people I love that aren't going to be coming. They're not going to be, it's not, there's so many people in this world right now that are going the wrong direction that I'm like, Lord, if you could just wait, there's going to be a day where I'm like, I don't want to wait anymore. But right now I'm like, Lord, I just need you to wait because there are so many people that are hurt and that are lost that don't know you. And so, but I'm going to tell you this, when that day does come, 
and we have our mindset that we have lived for eternity and we paid the price and we've suffered, here's the deal. Reward's going to come like we never imagined. I want everybody to close your eyes all around the room. All around the room. Lord, we praise you, God, and we thank you for being so good. If you were here today, and you know what? You've lived the world, and most of us, you've lived your life for the temporary, for the stuff. And, and that's what you're consumed with. That's what our thoughts are consumed with. And if you're there today and you're like, I've been living for the temporary, but I recognize there is more to life than just living for the temporary. And I want that mindset to change. And I want to live for the eternal and not for the temporary. I want my life to have a purpose and to have a point and to have a meaning where it's not just about me but where I live my life not for the temporary, but where I make a choice to live my life for the eternal, where I say no to myself and my desires to say yes to him and his call. If you're here today and maybe you've never surrendered your life to his purpose or his plan, maybe you did it one time, but you've seen your life grow so consumed with other things that don't matter. Do you know what? Those other things aren't making your heart happy or full of joy. They're leaving you more empty. If you are here today and you say, Tom, my heart, my life isn't given to him. It's not devoted to him. He's not in control, but I want him to be, and I need him to be. Pray for me. Pray with me all around the room right now. If you said, Tom, my heart, my life's not right, but today I want it to be. I need it to be. Pray with me. Pray for me. I want that in my life right now. If that's you right now, lift up your hands all around the room. You say, my life isn't right. My heart's not devoted, but I want it to be. Lift them up high. God bless both of you right there. God bless you too. Right there and right there and over there and over there and right there. And God bless you and God bless you and you and you and you. And God bless you, ma'am, and you, sir, and you, sir. Right back there, right back there. God bless you all around the room. Today I will give my life for his purpose and for his plan. Amen. I'm going to lead us in a prayer all around the room. I'd like everybody in the room to pray with me. From your heart surrendering to God, let's pray together. All of us praying together. Heavenly Father, I surrender to your purpose, to your plan. And I ask you, to use my life. Let my focus be on eternity and what really matters. And let my heart be yours. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. And I make a decision to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say this. Let's live our life with a purpose on purpose. Let's start having our focus on what really matters. And you know what will happen? Joy will come. Even in the midst of cruddy times, what will we do? We will rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. rejoice. That's where we're called to live our life.